Okay, good morning. My name is Paulo Sotero. I am with the director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. And uh, I'm very happy to be hosting this discussion, a little bit of history. About a year and a half ago, uh, Oscar Vilena contacted me saying that I have this project to write a book on the analysis of 30 years of the new constitution, and I needed to spend some 45 days somewhere doing this. The research is done, we need to do the writing, and I said, well, uh, I would be glad to, work to, to, to have you as a global scholar at the Wilson Center, and uh, we have known each other for quite some time. I follow Oscar's trajectory, especially as a leading human rights uh, lawyer in Brazil. And uh, the <coughs> lad who organized one of the most relevant institutions in that field, which is Connectus. Uh, and then I told him, well, we'll be glad to host you here, but I think you're going to have to spend uh, also some time at American University uh, because Judge Peter Massetti, who's here, uh, has led for now more than two decades the Brazil-U.S. Judicial Initiative. Uh, I learn about that as a journalist when I was invited to be one of two journalists, 1999, I think, 98 or 99, to uh, cover uh, a meeting that Judge Massetti organized with uh, leading uh, lawyers, uh, judges, uh, legal scholars uh, on Brazil, U.S. And so, uh, when Oscar gave me this, you know, the opportunity to host him here, I said, but I think you should be at a law school, because Oscar Villena is the dean of the law school of Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. And uh, so I think it worked out very well, because it was the appropriate, he should be there, not here most of the time, we supported in whatever, whatever way we could. And uh, the book, which we have here, uh, Batalha dos Poderes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Batalha dos Poderes was published uh, late last year, around the time the Constitution turned 30. It was October? Yes, some days before the election. Yes. Uh, and. Uh, uh, was well re well received in uh, in the media, in specialized media, and now the good news is that uh, there is a translation being made. This book is will be published uh, in English. We will be glad to publish online, uh, but hopefully there will be also a publishing house that will have the the actual book available, because it's an important contribution to understanding the interplay of the different branches of government uh, in Brazil in this 30 years of democracy. As you know, a complicated democracy, a very complex reality we live today in Brazil, uh, and this will be part of the talk, because not only uh, uh, Oscar, but uh, Peter Masset is also very familiar with uh, the crisis. And uh, there will be two aspects to this discussion, I believe. One is the crisis currently focused on the fact that Brazil, the country that produced uh, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, the first man of the people, one of the most unequal societies on earth, uh, 
uh, becoming president after Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and now we have sort of the opposite of all of this, uh, a, a very conservative uh, populist uh, that has recently declared that he really doesn't like very much the job. <laughs> because he is not, yeah, he said that more than once already. He said that uh, this is not, uh, and I'm not, you know, fit for this. I, I'm a military person, which actually he is not, because he couldn't go up in the ranks. He had to leave a captain. Uh, so, uh, there is this, and there is, which is a very important part of this book, what happened with the different elements uh, of our democracy, especially the focus on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in Brazil has assumed a role that is rare in a democracy. It actually, it can vote, it can uh, void decisions approved by Congress, which is kind of, right? Here, for instance, as we know, from time to time, there is a big decision in the Supreme Court, sort of, a, we are not going to touch that and let the representatives of the people decide what the way we should go. Uh, in Brazil, there is, I think, no instance where our Supreme Court judges think that they should not have a say. They, they believe that they can talk and decide about everything, and that has created problems. But I will stop here, and I will just... Uh, uh, remind you that Oscar Villena is the dean of the Getulio Vargas Law School uh, in Sao Paulo. Uh, he comes from the Catholic University of Sao Paulo, that's where he got his law degree, LLM at Columbia University, uh, uh, a PhD from the University of Sao Paulo, very active participant in uh, the political debate in Brazil, including through the media. He writes a uh, bi-weekly column for Folha de São Paulo and is invited uh, to a number of uh, discussions. Uh, he was just in, at Harvard at the Brazil conference moderating a panel with the chief justice of Brazil and a senator. Uh, Peter Massetti, Judge Peter Massetti is uh, the closest friend uh, Brazil has in the federal judiciary in, Brazil, in the United States was a Peace Corps volunteer in Brazil, is, has a degree, a law degree from uh, the University of Chicago, uh, and uh, has been uh, connected to Brazil since that time, has many friends there, understands Brazil very well and we call him the Juiz de Fora, because <laughs> he's the, he is our preferred judge, and uh, has collaborated with the Brazil Institute since the time I was not here, <laughs> so it's uh, since 99. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you both here. It's an honor, actually, and uh, how do we go about this? You start, and then Peter comment, Take and then, turn. okay. Sir, Should I? the floor is yours. So thank you very much, all of you, to, to be. It's very kind of you to, to be here this morning. I really would like to, to thank both uh, Paulo and, 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 Pete and just Judge Peter Massetti for the welcome that they, and they made this book possible. Uh, I was really, I had this invitation uh, to work on this book by Compania das Letras since uh, the, the end of 2017. And uh, they wished me to do a book about how nice the Brazilian democracy was, mostly uh, addressed to, to youth uh, people. And after several months, I couldn't do the book because the situation in Brazil was getting worse and worse. And I said, no, I. I I don't want to do a book about this. What I can do is a book about the crisis, so not direct, directly to the, the, the youth. And so I called Paulo and he told the story. They received me very warmly here. Uh, Peter, uh, I, I had the privilege to work in, on his uh, 
on his room, his table at the American University. So if there's some quality, it was your inspiration to, to the book. Uh, so it was great to be here. It was a book written really in, in a very short period of time and with a lot of uncertainty because uh, it's very difficult to analyze something that is moving. <laughs> and and, and uh, the situation was moving very rapidly in, in Brazil. So in, in some sense, uh, Paulo also, uh, Paulo's ideas are also in the book because we talked every, every uh, week and, and some nights uh, to try to understand what was going on in Brazil. So thank you very much. I would never uh, uh, have done this book without your, your support, the Wilson Center support, the American University support, and, and, and your creativity, intelligence, that is in some way in the book. So thank you, Paul, and thank you, Peter. Uh, besides the dinners and everything that you <laughs> made it, my life here uh, without family, um, also more comfortable. Well, uh, I don't want to, to try to explain the whole book, which I think would be meaningless, but to bring some highlights, and that's what Peter and I decided to, to perhaps uh, do. The book is basically divided in, in, in four parts. Uh, one, uh, and is the beginning of the book, is about what was happening in Brazil. What uh, uh, kind of movement uh, started after the mass uh, protests in 2013 in Brazil. For those who are familiar with the Brazilian uh, situation, in 2013, uh, millions of, of young people uh, went to the streets to protest for a very singular thing, was the price of the bus ticket in Sao Paulo. And this uh, moved people around the country, and it, uh, the agenda of this uh, youth uh, became expanded to other issues, basically uh, social, uh, social uh, uh, services uh, as education, health, uh, and then it become more uh, acute on the terms of corruption and then on the criticism of the political system. And this uh, destabilized something that seems to be very stable. The political system was amazingly stable uh, since 1988. So basically the book makes this question, what happens? We all know no one would disagree that we enter in a, a dramatic political crisis that was uh, uh, related with a profound economic recession. But my question, it was this uh, uh, conjunction of economic crisis and political crisis affected uh, the health of the constitutional system? Are we also in a constitutional crisis? And then try to understand what is the difference between a constitutional crisis and a political crisis. So this is uh, the main objective of the first chapter that I will uh, talk a little bit about it uh, later. Then the book tries to explain uh, the Brazilian constitution. It was, in, in, in the beginning, a book about the, the 30 years of the constitution. So there's a, another chapter try to explain why the Brazilian constitution was made as it was, because it's a, a kind of a different constitution. Most uh, US jurists view the Brazilian constitution as a, a kind of eccentric, and I try to explain uh, these eccentricities and try also to remove some misinterpretations of why the Constitution is as it is. Uh, and then there is a, a long chapter that I think is the most um, interesting in the book about the role of the Supreme Court, and Paulo mentioned a little bit. So perhaps I will try to, to talk a little bit about these uh, three issues. So uh, the Brazilian Constitution uh, is uh, perhaps the the absence of the transition uh, uh, to democracy in Brazil. The transition to democracy in Brazil uh, happened during the negotiations of the, the 1988 constitution. And one aspect of this uh, constitutional process was the high level of distrust among 
the players involved during the constitutional process and why they were uh, absolutely distrustful of each other. Because the transition was long and uh, marked by several frustrations. We have uh, the movement for Direta Ja that was frustrated. We have the election of uh, Tancredo Neves that died and we have the frustration to start the new democracy with the former president of the party of the military regime that was President Sarney. And also there was a, 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 an idea during the transition movement that there wasn't the necessity to rebuild the constitution. And Sarney killed this idea by proposing an amendment just to reform the military regime, what we call the constituinte instituida, institutionalize uh, cons constituency power. So it was a, a kind of a paradoxical idea. So when uh, they sit uh, in 1987 to start the constitutional uh, uh, debates, there was a perception following the Brazilian tradition that just a few uh, uh, stars in Congress should make a committee, propose a document, and this propo proposal would be sent to the, the colleagues to be uh, ratified. And uh, uh, Ulysses Guimarães, who was the head of the Constitution Assembly, uh, called a person called Fernando Henrique Cardoso to say, people are very unsatisfied of not participating in the, constitu in, in the constitutional debate. Could you write uh, the bylaws of the Constitutional Assembly? And Fernando Henrique wrote something very peculiar at that moment. Uh, first, everyone would be involved in the Constitutional Assembly in the, in, with the same status. There would be no special committee. And it, will, it would start by the subcommittee on topics, rights, courts, uh, uh, the, the, the federal system, the fiscal system, and uh, uh, we would have a, a kind of rule to insert things on the document. There was a, a, a very uh, easy rule to insert topics in the Constitution. So in some way, uh, the, the Constitutional Court, uh, the, Constitu the Constitutional Assembly opened itself for all the, the forces that were involved during the whole transitional process to insert things in the Constitution. So, Different than the, the U.S. Constitution, I think the Brazilian Constitution was a everyone first choice. Everyone that had power during the transition period inserts some of their wishes, goals, aspirations in the Constitution. And in the end of this uh, assembly, where they should vote it, the Constitution was under such a pressure from Sarney in the middle of a, an economic crisis uh, that the, the the mechanism of bargaining uh, produced was that if you, uh, what was the, the, the specific group's larger interests, if you accept that your large interest is inserted in the Constitution, you do not veto other people's uh, interests. So that's why uh, my conception at the, at the, 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 the book is that is uh, a maximization compromise. I accept yours and you accept mine. And that's why the Constitution is so uh, ubiquitous, so it's everywhere, it's talk, it's talk about everything, and it's so ambition, uh, it's so ambitious. And then, since people were very scared about the implementation, the, the Constitution was got with a lot of skepticism when it was adopted, also they placed a lot of power on the hands of the Supreme Court to moderate the implementation of this constitution. So it is an ambitious constitution, but guarded by a Supreme Court with powers that I don't see any parallel in other Supreme Courts around the world. Why? Because the Supreme Court received three kinds uh, of missions. Uh, first, it's a constitutional court in the European model. So it can receive cases directly uh, uh, and it's open to several political actors to provocate the Supreme Court. So every political party, every governor, uh, the bar association, federal unions, they all can go directly to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is a court of less reviews as in the United States. 
and the Supreme Court has a specific function, which is be a first instance on every case against politicians that are in Congress, that are in the cabinet, and against administrative acts of major uh, officials in, in, in the administration. So in this way, the court functions as a first instance to control the political world. And this is a new thing. If you, here in the United States, you would have the dispersion of all these functions in the ordinary judiciary, uh, you have in a court of appeals. So in Brazil, everything was concentrated in the hands of the, of the Supreme Court. So you have this extremely ambitious constitution and you have a court with super uh, powers uh, uh, to control the, the political world. And Paulo was mentioned something that I think is extremely peculiar to the, to, to the Brazilian constitution. When it, it was done, when the project was done and, and people saw that it was such an ample uh, document that would obviously uh, face difficulties to adapt to circumstances. Uh, Ulysses Guimarães, who was the head of the, 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 uh, of the Constitutional Assembly, had the idea to make the Constitution more flexible. Brazil had a tradition of having constitutions that could be amended in the same way the US Constitution is by two thirds. And uh, they said, well, but this is a very large document with several difficulties. Perhaps we should flexibilize. So they create a new rule of three fifths, which is 60% of, of, of the House without any ratification by state. So it's, it's pretty easy to reform the Brazilian Constitution. However, they create a system which make impossible to reform the core values of the Constitution. So we follow the German uh, Constitution of 1949 and create what we call the carved in stone clauses, clausulas petrias. So you cannot make an amendment that uh, could destroy a separation of powers, rights, federation, and democracy. So in some way, Brazil created a peculiar document, which is very large, but has a core that is, if not impossible, extremely difficult to reform. And a periphery document in the Constitution that is major, composed of public policies that were inserted in the Constitution, the tax public policy, the social security public policy, the educational public policy. So it is a large document. Uh, around 75% of the Brazilian Constitution is composed of major public policy. And 25% is what you would consider a real constitution that organized powers that organize democracy, that uh, establish the view of rights. So this constitution uh, that was created at that time, that was received with a lot of skepticism, mostly by those who were uh, 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 beaten during the Constitutional Assembly, the, the right and the, the, the economic liberals. Uh, this constitution was put in place in 1988 and uh, amazingly, uh, was capable to contribute to the stabilization of the Brazilian political system since, since then. Just to have one note on, on the political system, it is uh, also peculiar because we adopt a presidential system with a proportional electoral system uh, for the election of the lower house, which means that Brazil had the proliferation of political parties. And we had, at the time of the Constitution, 12 political parties. Today, we have more than 30 political parties in, in, in the parliament. So we had this uh, constitution that basically constitutionalized everything, a court that was super powerful, and a political system based in the re relationship of a president that would always need to have uh, 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 the creation of coalition base in, in Congress to govern. If the president is unable to form a large coalition with many parties, he or she would not uh, see the end of its mandate. And we had two impeachments uh, uh, in, this, in this 30 years.
uh, caller who was absolutely unable to, to put together a, a solid coalition and Dilma that lost its coalition in the mid of her uh, second mandate. So this is uh, the basic equation that I will try, uh, that, uh, that I analyze, this is my map of how the political system works, how the constitution is. So what happened in, in 2013 and what are the motives that we emerged in this uh, political and this economic crisis? Basically, uh, and, the, and why the Supreme Court is so involved on this. Basically, in, uh, in 2006, in 2005, the Supreme Court decided that uh, reform of the political system proposed by Cardozo 10 years before that would create a clause we call uh, uh, a clause that would limit the number of political parties was unconstitutional. So this was one movement of the Supreme Court. The second movement was the Supreme Court trying to reform the political system decided that people could not shift from one to another party, the fidelity clause. If you are elected by one party, you cannot move without losing your seat in Congress. So at this moment, the Supreme Court did not understood that would, what this would cause. Uh, it would cause the creation of new political parties because you could not move to an old party, but you can move to a new party that you are creating. Okay. So from 2006 to 2013, we moved from 12 parties to more than 30 parties. Uh, so this uh, creates what I call a, a, a system where the president would not negotiate with three or four parties as Cardoso did with four or five parties or Lula did, but Dilma had to negotiate with 12, 13 parties to make its coalition. And the coalition was based in a very uh, opposite ideological group. So you have right wings and left wings that should serve as the base for the president. So the cost of governance became higher and higher. And this is in some way related to the corruption scandals that we started to see with the Mensalão, which was the first uh, scandal uh, trial by the Supreme Court and televised, so that put the Supreme Court on the spot, and then the Lava Jato. So in some way, uh, the corruption I'm not trying to take the, res the moral responsibility of those involved in these acts, but also the corruption is a consequence of a political system where everyone that arrives at the seat of the president would only stay there and would only move its policies if it creates a very stable uh, coalition. And this coalition, if you have more than 30 parties, would necessarily include parties that are dishonest, uh, parties that do not agree with you, and, and this is fomenting uh, the corruption. So this is, uh, I think, the, the, on the basis uh, of, the, of the structures why the political system, the Brazilian political system, entered in crisis. The second uh, was as a consequence of the economic uh, recession, and several uh, economists, my friends, uh, would say that if Brazil grows less than 3% a year, the constitution is impossible. Okay. To the expenditures organized by the constitution demands a level of growth that is more than 3% a year. So if the growth decreases, the constitution, the public services, the rights inserted in the constitution it start to malfunction. It is impossible to pay everything. But I think this is one part of the problem. The second part of the problem, and then I return to the Constitutional Assembly, is that the Brazilian Constitution is not just generous in terms of rights, of health rights, educational rights, social uh, uh, security rights. The Constitution is also uh, very generous in terms of privileges. The privileges of public servants, the privileges of military that have 
uh, completely different uh, uh, social, sec uh, social security uh, system uh, where they retire with their full salaries, every member of the, the uh, civil servant. So it is, uh, you have in the Constitution, both in this area of pensions and in the areas of, of taxation, the Brazil has perhaps the most regressive tax systems around the globe. So it is very difficult how the, all the transference of uh, the distributive side of the Constitution provided by the rights is in some way counterweighted by an extremely regressive system of concentration of wealth. So this is why the Constitution is, uh, the right criticize the Constitution for being ineffective, which is right, because the distribution is in some way uh, uh, re, uh, uh, concentrate uh, by the tax system and by the other privileges inserted in the Constitution. So, the, the political crisis and the economic crisis that had a major impact on social rights was perhaps the cause of the manifestations that started in, in, in 2013 and the corruption scandal uh, uh, as a consequence of the inefficiency of the political system was the major uh, aspect of uh, this manifestation. So, no one disagreed that there was a crisis, uh, but this crisis uh, put in place a new dynamic at the Brazilian political system. We had the most polarized election in 2014. Uh, the election of Dilma was uh, challenged at the electoral courts by uh, the opposite candidate, Aécio Neves. Uh, that was the first time during the Brazilian democracy that this happens. So it is seen today as a very irresponsible, for the first time, not acceptance of the result. Uh, at that moment, uh, uh, the electoral court uh, uh, started a, a, a procedure that would be trialed two years later, and this is another aspect. Uh, the movementations on the streets changed a lot after the election. The young uh, students that were claiming for more rights, for health, for education, transportation, uh, left the streets and a new civil society occupied the streets, a much more conservative civil society that perhaps people didn't have an idea. You start to see manifestations in, in pro the, the military uh, and the impeachment movement was set in place. So in 2015, uh, Dilma was impeached. Uh, it is a controversial impeachment in some way, uh, and then I think Peter could give a little uh, uh, discussion about the, the comparison about the, the Brazilian model. Uh, the Brazilian constitution uh, provides that the person can be impeached, and one of the reasons is to offend the budgetary law. And Dilma was impeached based on this, uh, this clause of the Constitution and the 1951 legislation that regulates the impeachment. However, the process uh, is a very complex process because they had the Speaker of the House was Eduardo Cunha, who was a recognized crook uh, in the country, and he started the, the, the process. He's in prison now. Uh, for much, much worse crimes than, than uh, Dilma would ever dream to, to commit. Uh, and the impeachment uh, was, uh, um, in the end, the Senate uh, condemned Dilma. She lost her, her position. And the vice president, who have been in prison last week or uh, two weeks ago, he's Michel Temer, he's free again, but there are 10 other uh, charges against him. Uh, who was uh, connected with this president of the house, assumed power. Uh, and uh, my, the whole book is, is about this, this moment, and I would not bother you with, with this. Uh, but for me, uh, the question was, is this a constitutional crisis? When you have a second president impeached, when you have the, the president of the, how, the house in prison by the Supreme Court without a clear rule authorizing the Supreme Court to do this. Uh, when you have the vice president that was in the ballot with the president, there is this old process of the electoral court pending against her and all the, the documentation showing that 
obvious they have used illegal money during the campaign, but the court just shift the process, say, well, now against the vice president, we will not uh, 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 suspend the election of 2014. So there are several uh, movementations, and the behavior of the institutions was really, uh, could be really uh, considered a different kind of, 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 of uh, tradi uh, from the, tra the departure from the traditional way of behavior. So, is this a constitutional crisis? Uh, then uh, I started to revisit you know, the old books as Carl Schmitt to understand what was considered a constitutional crisis in Germany uh, and the new literature in US after, after the election of Trump, what is a constitutional crisis? So basically I, 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 I try to do three things. First, what is not a constitutional crisis? a rupture of the Constitution as the coup in 64 in Brazil, or a erosion, completely erosion of the Constitution as the Germans have been after uh, 1933. So the guy was elected, and from there he made several changes in the Constitution, and the Weimar Constitution just uh, disappeared as uh, a, 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 the original document. So, Certainly, this was not happening in Brazil. We didn't have a coup, and we didn't have the erosion of the Constitution. We have uh, something different. Uh, so the, the literature on constitutional crisis characterized two things as classical constitutional crisis. The first is when uh, the political or economic crisis uh, are uh, challenging the powers, and they say it is impossible to solve this without extra constitutional measures. So this is a classic constitutional power. And we have some aspects of this. Uh, perhaps your civil war could be, well, you cannot do after the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, we cannot solve this issue without an extra constitutional measure going to war or whatever. The second is when the conflict among the powers uh, does not channel this, the political conflict and it overflow uh, to society and society enters in, in systematic conflict with violence. So the constitution is not able anymore to serve, to contribute, to coordinate political conflict and society enters in direct conflict. Well, for, uh, you can say it's a strange, but even though Brazil passed through all this in five years, we didn't have social conflict. People could go, people would disagree profoundly with each other, people would hate each other in, 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 the, uh, in the internet, but they would not kill each other. Besides the attack on Bolsonaro, which was very eccentric to this uh, moment, we didn't have any kind of political violence in Brazil. So there was a, ba a battle between powers uh, where all of the, them claim they were defending the Constitution. So that is what I, I think describes Brazil, uh, uh, describes this, uh, um, we had obviously uh, several uh, you know, human rights uh, lawyers being killed, but this is traditional in Brazil. And in the, well, unfortunately, yes. Uh, you know, if we I, I've been working with human rights for the last 30 years, so people on, 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 on the rural areas, the number of people being killed is enormous. Uh, Brazil has enormous violence in urban areas and you know, young black uh, uh, are being massacred in, in the Brazilian peripheries. Marielle Franco is an example of a human rights advocate that was eliminated. But uh, uh, as a, a direct consequence of mass conflict, systematic conflict between the forces on the streets, we didn't see this. So in this uh, sense, I think uh, it is a peculiar form of crisis. What is this, the peculiarity of this form of crisis? In my perception is that uh, uh, major institutions as the Supreme Court, as Congress, as lower, uh, 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 lower uh, uh, instance of the judiciary, he started to use 
their attributions, their competences, their powers in a heterodox way. They would use them mostly to hurt their political enemies. So even though the game was being played by the institutions, they were playing what uh, Mark Tushnet, uh, uh, US constitutional scholar, say hardball. They were not playing a fair game. So uh, my perception is that we, we enter, we emerged uh, after 2013 in a kind of constitutional regression. Uh, we were uh, using the constitutional grammar. Institutions were acting under their uh, jurisdictions. However, they were using their power in disconformity of, with what we would expect they would be used. So uh, for those who are, I'm sorry to use uh, soccer metaphors here, uh, with the, the Latin American championship, uh, which is a very harsh and violent uh, championship, you know, really under uh, the expectations of those who love soccer. And in the end you say, but is this still soccer or not? Or they are playing a different game. So I think what happened in Brazil is a, a level of conflictuosity between uh, institutions and between the powers that are acting on, uh, uh, under their uh, constitutional mandates, but they are acting improperly under their, their uh, uh, mandates. And this creates a different kind of, of crisis. It's not a classical crisis, but perhaps is a, re a regression on the way the uh, constitutional uh, game, the democratic constitutional game should play. So, this is my conception of crisis. The institutions are all there. They are all, uh, ent perhaps they enter in a cycle of retaliation. We had uh, last two weeks this kind of retaliation, the Supreme Court making a decision and Congress saying we're gonna impeach three of your justices. So this is the kind of retaliation that we are talking about. And then uh, uh, the head of the lower house receiving the package of reforms proposed by Minister of Justice, which is a very ordinary thing to happen in the beginning of government, and say, well, the, he has no idea of what he is doing. I will not analyze his package. And next day, uh, the father-in-law of the head of the lower house is imprisoned by a judge in Rio de Janeiro, very connected with uh, Judge Moro who is the Minister of Justice. So my perception is that really we enter in a cycle of retaliation and institutions have been weaponized by the power holders to defend their interests and to attack their adversaries. And this is uh, what, in my perspective, is happening since 2013 and is obviously uh, uh, more acute at this, uh, at this moment. So just to, to close, I think I'm speaking too much, uh, the Supreme Court, as I said, the Supreme Court uh, has these three functions, and uh, it's using this power with, uh, without any ceremony, and the Supreme Court has one power, uh, which is uh, not very common in other countries, which is the power to control the constitutionality of amendments to the Constitution. So if there is a battle between Congress and the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court always has the last word. Okay? So can you imagine a Supreme Court that has the last word in a Constitution that is enormous? So it has the last word about everything. So the notion that you have, and I think Peter could uh, you know, give a, a better approach to this, that the court is deferent to Congress, that accepts the decisions of Congress. In Brazil, we don't have this perspective. It's very rare that in a conflict, the, the court would say, well, Congress has decided in this way, even if it's not a good decision, they have the power to decide on these issues. Through the perspective of the justice at the Brazilian Supreme Court, they are the ones who measure if the decision taken by Congress is a correct decision in most all subjects. So they became 
a central uh, uh, power in the Brazilian uh, uh, political system. This is one point. The second point is that they have this primary uh, competence to trial every member of parliament. And they start to use this power in 2006 with the Mensalão case that put in prison several of ministers and some members of the parliament during the Lula administration. And all of this was televised. And this gave a lot of uh, power and visibility to the judiciary. In some sense, Justice, uh, Judge Moro uh, was an assistant to the Supreme Court at that moment. He started this large investigation in Curitiba and was backed by the Supreme Court in all circumstances. And that what make him available, uh, made possible this, uh, this large investigation. So the Supreme Court also uh, uh, was uh, uh, immersed in this same uh, political crisis during the 2013-2018 election. Just to, to, to finalize and to shut up, um, it's obviously that now the, the Constitution, even though I do not believe we left, this uh, non-classical crisis that we enter in 2013, but it has a, a new challenge uh, because obviously the election of 2018 uh, put in power a group of people that uh, had along their lives uh, express a lot of hostility to the constitutional principles. So it's not, you know, not, it's not an interpretation. Bolsonaro has passed his whole 27 years in Congress saying he was in favor of dictatorship, he was in favor of torture, he's against all this rights talk about uh, indigenous people. So it's obviously that for the first time we have a president that does not belong to the consensus of the constitutional moment of, 2000, of 1988. So Cardoso, Sar even Sarney, Cardoso, uh, uh, Lula, they all belong to that moment. The foundational moment of the new democracy in Brazil was built by these groups, even though they disagree on the periphery, they have a, pr a project to the country that is expressed in the 1908 constitution. Those who ascend to power in the last election, the last election the three groups, so the uh, far-right bolsonaristas, the military that obviously were never happy with uh, the Constitution, even though it's a different generation and we have to, tomorrow Moran will be here to explain this, and uh, the, the extreme economic liberals, uh, which with the sign, the, the signal change, the liberal in Brazil meaning uh, new liberal here, uh, that were always critical to the Constitution. So now we have in power basically a, a, a political group that is contrary uh, to the Constitution. So this is the great challenge for the resilience of the Constitution, as Paulo put in, in, in the invitation to have you here. So thank you, and I'm sorry to speak so much. No, that's fine. First of all, I want to congratulate uh, Professor Villeno uh, on his work. It's excellent. I've read it. I recommend it to you either in Portuguese uh, or English. I think it is going to become, it needs a little time, uh, the definitive study really of uh, how the Constitution in Brazil has fared over 30 years. And you hear from his, his very remarks how perceptive he is of weaving together the various themes that are out there. I'm going to make a few observations, uh, mostly by way of counterpoint to what we have in the United States versus some of the observations that, that he has made. And in general, he does say that since uh, uh, 2013, there has been a grave political crisis in Brazil. I don't think you'd say that in the United States. Obviously, there is serious divisions of opinion in this country. There is a lot of dissatisfaction with the president. Uh, people are not very cordial to one another in the debate. I would not call it a grave political crisis. Some people might here, but I don't think it's quite uh, as intense as one would find in Brazil. Our democratic institutions are doing pretty well. Our economy is strong, so we're not really worried about that. Uh, I do want to compare a few 
institutions in the United States and situations uh, here with what is in Brazil. Uh, just, and this always helps when I come in as the kind of uh, perspective commentator. I mean, bear in mind Brazil and the U.S. have about the same land mass. Brazil has 100 million people less than the United States. Uh, we are a bigger country here. Brazil is a civil law country in the sense that they follow the Roman German concept, which basically relies on codes, uh, not so much on the case law, although that's changing in Brazil. Uh, we are a common law system, and at least historically, we relied largely on uh, what the Brazilians call jurisprudencia, case law, in addition. But we have a constitution here, as does Brazil, and we have a lot of ordinary law of the sort that's made by the legislature. But essentially, we come from those different traditions. Brazil and the United States both have federal systems, but the 50-plus jurisdictions in the United States have considerable sovereignty to legislate in matters, everyday matters of, of uh, uh, law, uh, whether it's criminal or civil, whether it's uh, 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 rape or torture or anything like that, that would, would be tried in the uh, uh, courts of the states. Whereas in Brazil, the uh, state courts, if you will, still are applying the national law for the most part, the national codes. So there is that, uh, that difference. Uh, we have written constitutions, both countries, uh, similar in the sense that we are both, I think, undertaking to define the basic structures of government and how they relate to one another. Bear in mind, Brazil has had eight constitutions since Declaration of uh, Independence, if you will, the Grito de Piranga in 1822. We have had, essentially, federal level one. Uh, that's uh, a difference. Uh, Brazil has a tripartite government, the way we do, executive, legislative, judicial. Both countries have a president who uh, heads the executive, but we have an electoral college here. In Brazil, the president is directly elected. So you can end up with a president who, forgive me, White House, not so far away, loses the popular vote and becomes elected president. That would not really happen in Brazil, but that's a major, a major difference. Uh, both countries popularly elect their legislators, whether they in the houses of uh, the Câmara dos Deputados, which is like, comparable to our House of Representatives, or the Senado, the Senate. They're popularly elected, but as Professor Vidata points out, maybe from 30 parties. We basically elect from two parties. Maybe there's a Bernie Sanders out there who occasionally gets elected as an independent. But basically, we are electing in this country from two parties. And that's a major difference. As he points out, I think very perceptively, it's really this proliferation of parties that in many ways leads to the corruption. You have to sort of pay to get the people together in the coalition. I don't think we quite have that uh, in, this, in this country. Now, about courts. Uh, there are uh, both federal and state courts in Brazil and the United States. At the federal level in both countries, there are three tiers. There's a first instance a court. I am a federal district judge. There's an intermediate appeals court. There are 12 regional and one geographic court. And we have a Supreme Court in the United States. Brazil has three level courts uh, at the federal level. They have courts of first instance. They have uh, tribunais regionais federais in, in various regions of the court. And they have a uh, he, uh, Professor Rilliani uses the term Supreme Court in, in Brazil. I'm going to use the word Supreme Federal Tribunal because actually that's the literal translation and I don't want to confuse it with our Supreme Court, but they have the same. Uh, now, Brazil has uh, an electoral court. You heard him ref refer to that. We don't have anything like an electoral court in the United States, but it's a court system and they actually have trials. They make decisions involving elections and so on. We don't have that. They have a very elaborate system of labor courts. We do not have that. We have uh, some labor, labor uh, entities that deal with different issues, such as the rights of unions to, to uh, unionize and uh, individual uh, uh, rights of, of uh, uh, unfair labor practices, which is our National Labor Relations Board. But we have a very fragmented system of labor law. Brazil has an integrated system of labor law with its uh, courts. Now, uh, Professor Virginia focuses on the Supreme Federal Tribunal. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But what I'd like to do is just make a few general observations about what I would call the extra legal points that uh, Professor Villena makes. Uh, again, he talks about the great political crisis that exists uh, uh, and the battle, frankly, among the branches of government. Now, you've seen some real tension in the United States of late between the legislative Congress and the president over whether he can end run a decision that was made about how money should be spent 
with regard to the, uh, the borders. We have that kind of tension, but I wouldn't call it so much retaliation. We may be getting to a point where it's gonna to go to the courts, obviously. It will be decided whether the White House decides to accede to, accept the decision, remains to be seen. We may yet have a constitutional crisis. We don't yet, but we certainly have a lot of tension. Uh, we don't really have tension between the executive, between the legislative and the judiciary. They're fairly respectful of one another. We have some tension between the executive and the judiciary, so-called judges, I'm one of those. Uh, you know, there is that, that maybe the courts will or will not be respected, but I don't think it's at the level of crisis and it certainly is not at the level of retaliation. Uh, the political orientation of the members of the court, that's another story and I'll say something about that uh, of late. Uh, he talks about impeachment. Uh, we have not had, uh, all, we've only had one impeachment of late in this country, but he talks of Kohler, he talks of Dilma. Uh, and of course they have a president uh, who's now serving time in jail, uh, Lula, for, for not for uh, any kind of uh, 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 using the budget improperly, but uh, for frankly outright crimes of bribery and money laundering and so on. But here's a different sort of situation. Uh, and let me, let me make a distinction. In the United States, when you impeach somebody, you don't remove them from office. Impeachment means you simply charge them with a crime. They're removed from office when the Senate decides, based on the impeachment by the House, that someone should be removed. So uh, what you, Kohler never got to that point, I guess. He was impeached, I think, formally, but he's, he resigned. Yeah. Dilma was impeached. She went right through the process, and the Senate said, you're through. And she was impeached, and as Professor Villena points out, some people think unfairly, for some funny business with moving money around uh, uh, on the budget. Bill Clinton was not impeached for some sort of impropriety of governmental action. He was impeached for personal reasons. Uh, he obstructed justice when he lied about whether he had sex with that woman, a little bit off track, really, from what you decide. And that's an interesting issue. Um, what, about, uh, what about Donald Trump? Well, we've got the Mueller report now, and maybe, maybe he won't be impeached. Uh, there are some people who think he should be, some people who think he could be. My guess is not likely. Uh, not likely to happen, but, but there would be at least some things that some people will point to that what he has done or not done is a high crime or misdemeanor, which is the only way impeachment uh, is defined in our Constitution. There aren't the specific uh, uh, bases that are set forth in legislation, either ordinary or constitutional. Uh, we, we debate all the time what a high crime and misdemeanor is, and we're not really sure and those things leave, uh, leave it to be uh, decided. So uh, we have our impeachment, but I think not really uh, at the level of uh, in uh, Brazil. Um, the impeachments in Brazil have had huge implications for political decisions and so on and so forth. I, I just got through listening, to, or almost through listening the, uh, the podcast on uh, Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton. You know, the, he left uh, office Clinton with the highest favorability rating he had all all the time. It really didn't have much impact ultimately on the decision. In Brazil, in contrast, when you talk about the uh, impeachment of Dilma, when you talk about uh, uh, Lula's bribery situation, the impact has been tremendous. Everything inter interacts, less so with Clinton. Surprisingly, that has faded, believe it or not. I mean, there's some repercussions still, and maybe the Me Too movement got some leverage back in the uh, Clinton, Monica Lewinsky days, but frankly, as far as the political impact, I would say, really not much. Gone, forgotten, not in a way that the impeachments in Brazil have been impactful. Now, uh, there also has been a reference to widespread corruption in Brazil, impunity uh, as features of the system, and I would say really, that there really hasn't been a situation of widespread corruption among the politicians in the United States. There have been cases, we have them, a lot of the actors in the Trump administration have been challenged for ethical insensitivity, but it's not quite the same as, as, as the uh, bribery. It has nothing like the dimension of the Mensalão big monthly scandal, nothing of the dimension of Lava Jato, uh, the Operation Car Wash, nothing like that here. Nothing, uh, uh, Operation Car Wash is basically the Odebrecht scandal uh, in large part. We don't have that uh, here. I mean, there are instances that are, as I say, come up now and again, but it's not widespread, it's not uh, intense. Um, Professor Villain also talks about the uh, tension between the interests of rich and poor in Brazil. Uh, that's there. Uh, we have some of that here. I mean, there's certainly the law, income inequality. If you listen to 
Senator Warren and others, uh, you're telling, they're telling you this is a major crisis, but I don't know that it's quite at the level uh, in Brazil. You had Lula making decisions uh, with social impact and money's being spent, and frankly, that's part of Dilma's impeachment, I think, that really sort of at the highest level had an impact. Here the debate goes on, but I don't know that it's more than a very intense debate. I would say here the, the issue is more, frankly, race-based these days. We are talking about racial tensions in this country, which are, are widespread. I mean, whether it spills over into the police misconduct and over and on and on. We talk about that. Racial issues are everywhere in Brazil, too. Don't mean to minimize, but I would say, uh, country-wise, where racial issues are probably more intense and preoccupying in this country, somewhat less so in Brazil, although it's there, uh, and to be sure. Um, back to the Constitution. Uh, the, just think about 30 years for a Brazilian Constitution, the U.S. Constitution adopted in 1787, more than 230 years ago, so big spread in time. And when you look at it, Brazil's Constitution uh, of 1988 was the product of a constituent assembly I think by my numbers are correct, but I think there were at least 550 members of the Constitutional Assembly. You know, we had, we had uh, Madison and Jefferson, and we had a kind of a small group of pretty high-level guys who were creating the Constitution back when. And so it was a different dynamic. And, and uh, uh, Brazil's Constitution, is, as the professor has pointed out, is lengthy and detailed. Uh, obviously, the U.S. Constitution by itself. The Brazilian Constitution originally had 235 articles, uh, has been amended more than 100 times since it was uh, put in place in uh, 1988. Uh, we have seven basic articles of the U.S. Constitution amended 27 times in 230 years. I mean, there are those perspectives. Uh, the Bra Brazilian Constitution is easy to amend. I think it's three-fifths of both houses, is it yes. not? Both the House and the Senate. No, no Senate, no state ratification required. If the Congress decides to amend, and they do it three-fifths in both houses, done. Here, uh, it's uh, two-thirds of both houses and three-fourths of the states. In other words, pretty tough. I think the Equal Rights Amendment is still out there floating around. Uh, it hasn't been, hasn't been uh, adopted by three-quarters of the states, and whether it's still viable, I don't know. But that's the kind of difficulty that uh, you have. And of course, Brazil has, as the, as the Professor Villana points out, a very long list of individual rights and guarantees. I mean, we have a Bill of Amendments, a Bill of Rights, uh, uh, First Ten Amendments, basic general language, due process of law, equal protection of the law, which Brazil also has, those language, but very general terms which have been fleshed out over the years by Supreme Court uh, case decisions, jurisprudencia, as the Brazilians would say. Brazil's Supreme Federal Tribunal has 11 ministers, 11, uh, those are the justices, the U.S. has nine, um, and let me tell you, the appointment, I, I, maybe you'll disagree with the, me on this, Oscar, but probably not. The appointment of a Supreme Court justice in the United State, States is a very big deal. <laughs> when, I mean, look at the Kavanaugh nomination. Look, look at what it generated in terms of writing back and forth and the televising and so on. Alexandre de Moraes, the Minister of Justice in Timmer's administration, was nominated in February and took office in March. Now, he had a Sabatino but it wasn't anything like, whoa, this guy's gonna take charge and we're gonna be in the soup. It wasn't like that. Here, it is a major issue because why? We have decisions being made on a five to four basis all the time, and it is really affecting major issues, abortion, affirmative action, on and on and on. So that's the way in which our Supreme Court uh, is functioning. And, and the Professor Villena says that the Supreme Federal Tribunal of Brazil decides all the issues of the day. I would say our court does too. All the critical issues that really get decided in, a, in the course of a year are decided by our Supreme Court, whether it's abortion, whether it's affirmative action, uh, I mean, on and on. Uh, and and there have been some different decisions that they've made, which are interesting contrasts, like uh, affirming, uh, uh, establishing uh, affirmative action for university uh, admissions in Brazil, not quite as easy in the United States. Outlawing uh, uh, in Brazil uh, campaign contributions by corpor corporations. Here it's the reverse, Citizens United. Many people would take issue with that. So in some ways you could say, well, that's probably a pretty thoughtful thing. Uh, I think the same with regard to abortion of uh, um, hydrocephalic uh, fetuses and so on. That's also been established as a principle in Brazil. Same-sex unions as well in Brazil. I mean, there's some what people of the United States would regard as somewhat progressive policies. 
Uh, and the, the United States the Supreme Court, as I say, uh, does much the same. We, we are very much involved with the comparable issues, whether it's abortion rights or voting rights, uh, religion, uh, corporate spending, as I said. Uh, our court does get involved. I think it was Finley Peter Dunn who said all the issues of today eventually end up in the Supreme Court. And largely that's uh, true. Some other points of contrast briefly between the two courts. Brazil, and this number may be way off, but I think they get 70,000 petitions a year at the Supreme Federal Tribunal. The U.S. Supreme Court gets about 7,000. and ends up hearing about 100, and uh -huh. maybe writing opinions in 80. Um, and again, that's a, a, a major contrast. But in Brazil, they have developed over the years a concept of, of uh, discretionary review, what, comparable to what we would call certiorari in the United States Supreme Court, and the same idea of binding precedent which is uh, uh, unusual for a civil law tradition to do that. Although to show how Brazil adapts to things, Taina, we were talking about this recently, about how things adapted. In Brazil, it isn't just what the majority decides. Eight of the 11 ministers on the Supremo have to decide that this court's decision in this case will bind everybody else. And they're doing more and more with that all the time. With what consequence? Fewer cases are supposedly to be coming up. And they did over time, they're, they're crawling up again because, and here's the real reason, there is a hyper-constitutionalization of rights in Brazil that makes everything, as I say, constitutional. I had a friend who wrote a book called My Neighbor's Dog, a Paulista woman, because she said she had a constitutional right to go to the Supremo because the dog was barking and keeping her up at night. And she mm. thought that she had a constitutional right to repose or glory or whatever. And it wasn't too far-fetched, I thought, the way she spoke of it. So there is that issue. Another issue he didn't touch on, which is very important, is this issue of what are called monocratic decisions by oh, justices. Just of, in the book. Uh, no, no, you, did, it, you did a great job in the book. You didn't mention it here. Yeah. And, and perhaps you could rejoin on that. A monocratic decision by a justice of the Supreme Court, a ministro, is one justice can make a decision that has nationwide impact. Now, why is that? Well, the theory, at least, is that the justice is doing a holding decision until the plenary can get to the issue. And that's true in the United States, too. You see a situation where Justice, Chief Justice Roberts has stayed execution in West Virginia because of they want to get the full court to decide. So there's some months of staying execution, giving extensions, things like that but very limited. You really can't make a long-term substantive decision if you're a single justice on the Supreme Court. That's not what happens in Brazil. The majority of the decisions that are made by the Supreme Court, I think, are monocratic. Am I correct? 95 percent. 95 percent. It's incredible. And, 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 and this is the kind of thing you get. There's a, one of the ministers of the court is named Marco Aurelio, uh, a competent gentleman, but he decides that he disagrees with what the plenary has said about once your conviction in the lower court is confirmed by the second instance, you go to jail. You don't have to wait until the end of the process. That's what the plenary decided. But he decided, no, no, that's not what I believe. And so he went off in another direction after that was said. Well, that couldn't happen, wouldn't happen here. And that's an issue which I think perhaps, Oscar, you could comment on afterwards because it is really a serious issue. Mm -hmm. And you have just uh, judges, not just at the Supremo, who are the decision to release President Tremor. Tremor was made by one judge who was awaiting a three-judge panel. What about that? Interesting issues. Briefly then, uh, let me see if I can wind up without much more here. Um, he did talk about special privileges in the high court that legislators have. Brazil has a concept known as privilege form, foro privilegiado, and certain high officials get tried in criminal cases in the Supreme Court. Instead of coming before a federal district judge like me, as a, someone else might in uh, our system, you go directly to that court. Well, think about it. That court, which is an appeals court, has to be situated to hear trials of these different people. I think they've limited it recently that it's only to uh, uh, omissions or deficiencies while you're in office, related to your office, before it was even broader than that. But that really slows things down and really d demonstrates an inequality of justice, if you will, that's troublesome. And I think <coughs> Professor uh, Villena points to that very well. Uh, there are certain other things in Brazil, as I say. Uh, our Supreme Court doesn't have authority, uh, criminal justice uh, authority except to review cases for other kinds of constitutional impediments. But you don't try a public official in the 
Supreme Court for the first uh, instance. Uh, it remains open in this case whether a, a president uh, can even be charged with a crime during his, uh, during his tenure in the United States. He can be impeached. We're still not sure he can be charged with a crime. That's, that issue is still out there. The Justice Department seems to have said he can't be, and we'll see about that. Uh, Professor Bilyana, not uh, uh, surprisingly, says some of the decisions uh, by the Supremo in Brazil have been overreaching. And I think a lot of that's probably true. And I think one could say the same thing about, about the United States. There are people who are troubled by the Citizens United decision that gave corporations the status of a person to make political contributions. That's a stunner. Uh, but that's what the court said, and, uh, and you live with it. Uh, well, I wanted to go back, uh, though, the, uh, the, the active roles for both the high courts in both systems, whether it's the Supremo in Brazil, the Supreme Court here, uh, it's going to be uh, controversial and it's going to be high profile from here on out. I mean, I think even with, with the appointment of uh, Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, there's a lot of concern about what's going to happen with uh, abortion rights and affirmative action, health care miscellaneous minority rights, we don't know yet what's going to happen. Uh, but as he's, interestingly, it's more on the ideological spectrum. I don't think people are thinking that there's retaliation so much as uh, radical ideological differences that may lead the court to uh, different positions here. In Brazil, I mean, uh, basically you have what's called, an uh, interesting term of Professor Verena, a suprememocracy, suprememocracy, supremocracy. Uh, and that's probably true. That's really what you have governing there. So uh, this is the interesting final point for me, that Professor Vildiana, for all that you've heard him say this morning, says the court has shown itself, not the court, the Constitution of 1988, has shown itself to be, quote, surprisingly resilient, end quote. In other words, after all this mishmash that you've heard out there, it's kind of, kind of working. Uh, and I think we can say the same in the U.S., but it's been a little longer. In any event, as they say in Brasilia, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for your presentations. Now we are we open for questions. Wait for the mic to come to you. Uh, ben and then Paul. Yeah. Reina, can you... Ben will go first, and then Paul here. Okay, uh, so my name is Benjamin Young. I'm a, a, a fellow at the center of this, uh, this semester. Um, but my main job is I'm an anthropology professor at the State University of New York. Um, and I've been working in Brazil for several years, uh, originally in Porto Alegre, more recently in Recife, looking at uh, political consciousness among that group formerly and contentiously referred to as the Nova Classice, the new, new middle class. And uh, of course, all of that has fallen into uh, precarity. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I learned so much from uh, both of your comments. So thank you very much. I'm not a, a legal scholar, so I, I, I learned a lot. Um, your, both of the presentations, but especially uh, Professor Oscar, uh, your um, comments made me remember being in, living in Porto Alegre in 2003 when Lula was uh, inaugurated. And I remember very vividly going to a, I'm sorry, it was actually the night of the election in 2002, uh, going to the celebration downtown and surprisingly encountering some of, of my friends and acquaintances who had voted for Jose Serra dancing with the crowd, which seemed so strange to me. And I asked them, what are you doing here? And they said, we're so, yeah, our candidate lost, but democracy is functioning, the constitution is functioning, we had a successful election, and we're happy about that. And that was so exotic to me, because we don't do that. And we don't go to a party to celebrate the function, functioning of our constitution. Now I say this now, I remember that with uh, some sadness because I f I, it's been years since I encountered that sentiment and to the contrary, it feels to me like the uh, uh, popular class Brazilians that I, uh, communities where I work in Hisifi, uh, there's very, there's a, an issue, now getting to my question, is about cultural memory. Um, 
there's been a lot of attention recently uh, with the Bolsonaro uh, rise uh, about ways that, P that Brazilians remember the PT years, the dictatorship, and I would say the Constitution needs to be added to this list. So my, my question uh, for you, for, for both of you, uh, really, uh, but um, is thinking about constit constitutional crisis, and this is a kind of an anthropological question, is, is of all the things that you mentioned, is it important that popular awareness and, you know, that, that ordinary people have an accurate and kind of uh, living interest in the Constitution, is that a part of whether there's a constitutional crisis or not? Perfect. Could we, so well, let's collect, you, let's you decide. collect a couple more and then we go back to, yes. Thank you, Tom. Yes, um, I Would was curious to know, you? sure. I'm Paul Johnson, I'm a consultant and a long time uh, uh, observer of Brazilian politics and society. Um, do you feel as a comparative basis of looking at the politics in, um, of the United States and Brazil, here the, the polity is animated by a uh, cause for safeguarding the Constitution and sort of um, guarding against the precepts of the Constitution. Do you find that's a motivating um, tool of the Brazilian polity as well? I mean, how, how much ownership in the Brazilian, uh, and, and, They're related. and does that uh, manifest itself different regionally or by different class or by different race? And I think also um, the patronage system, that the, the patronage system in Brazil, does that, uh, are there different characteristics of the patronage system regionally? Um, uh, there's a lot of tropes that you hear about the Northeast patronage system. How real is that? I mean, I mean how real is that vis-a-vis -vis other uh, regions of the country? It, is it real or is it a trope? Okay, uh, let's go with those two first. Please okay. try to be concise as we um, go back. So let me, um, it's wonderful that your anthropological approach about what the Constitution means and how important it is that people in some way have ownership or feel uh, on, uh, uh, part of the Constitution. It's interesting uh, that when the Constitution was um, accepted in, in, 2000 in, in 1988, as I said, there was a lot of skepticism and people would say this would not last for, uh, for many years. Uh, the Constitution itself had uh, a clause that established that in five years it should pass through a major review. Mm -hmm. Major review meaning you could change the Constitution just with uh, a single majority. You could change the Constitution. So five years later, nothing happened. Even there was a possibility of a referendum to change from presidential system to parliamentary system. Nothing happened. Uh, and in most of the economic crisis that we had around uh, on this 30 years, when people say we should change the Constitution, this discourse never resonates in the sense that we promote uh, major changes or to adopt a new Constitution. And that's why I, I use the term resilience. Why? Because it's so flexible that the Constitution was able to change during this 30 years, but always through the constitutional debate. So there was a constitutionalization of Brazilian politics. If Cardoso arrives to power and thinks that the Constitution was too anti-market, it promotes about 12 amendments to the Constitution that reshaped the Brazilian economy. Then Lula reshaped uh, part of the social welfare. So it's interesting how the Constitution was able to accept the demand, change itself without losing its core. And that's why I call the, you know, the, 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 the corns, the, the, the carbon stone clauses. So the Constitution is really 
uh, uh, resilient in this sense. Uh, so, uh, do people have ownership? The Constitution resisted because people defend them? And then I think there is some peculiarity and difference between the U.S. and Brazil, even though I think, you know, uh, in the U.S. there is some mysticism about, you know, how people have the Constitution as a religion, et cetera, et cetera. In Brazil, people have interests that are deeply entrenched in the Constitution. So if you say, let's open this game again, people say, uh-oh, I will lose something. Even if I don't like parts of the Constitution, I have something that really protects my deep interests. So if I am a union, I have deep interest to keep the Constitution as it is. If I am linked to education system, the Constitution has profound rights of education. If I'm linked to health, and, and you go on and on. Uh, so the, that's why the idea of maximizing compromise. Everyone has a first choice inserted in the Constitution. And that what created a specific kind of loyalty to the Constitution. So it's not a consensus loyalty. It's not because we all agree in all terms of the Constitution. It's because we all agree that the Constitution is very important to something that we care much. So as a human rights lawyer, I say, well, the Constitution has enormous problems, but has the best view of rights ever written in Brazil. So it's, it's, for me, it's strategically, it's very difficult to criticize uh, the Constitution. But this, I think, creates a loyalty, and this loyalty made the system uh, play fairly, and the changes in the Constitution were put in place through constitutional amendments with a lot of consensus. And that what kept the, the, the stability. Less uh, word about, uh, um, uh, you know, how, the, 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 how I, I think Constitution should be seen, uh, jurists like this judge here and, and all of us try to understand Constitution as a higher law. And, you know, any other thing that is in disagreement with the higher law should be kicked out of the system. I see today the Constitution much more as a coordination device uh, that enable adversaries to compete for power and to uh, accept the results of this competition. And what happened in Brazil along this 25 years that the competition among adversaries, as you saw in Porto Alegre, was going well and people would accept the results. What started to happen uh, uh, after 2013, and mostly at uh, uh, the election 2014, is that people would say that the results of the game would not be accepted. And uh, today, our friend uh, Sergio Fausto wrote a recent article uh, on Piauí saying, perhaps we don't have the, even the self-interest consensus around the Constitution anymore. And that is why uh, the situation is so dramatic. My perception is that in the near future, we will have changes. The, the crisis will uh, result in major changes in the Constitution. One major change is obvious the social pact is in danger. So we will have, uh, we had a reform of the labor law, which is you know, economically speaking, sound, but it is an impact on the original social compact, uh, both uh, also with uh, uh, the, civ the, the pension system now uh, and other issues. Uh, the issue of mandatory expenditure in the area of education and health that is inserted in the Constitution. Paul Lugadis is the Minister of Finance saying, we will remove this. So basically, all the social aspects, it is under a, a extreme pressure at this moment, and the political system uh, also is under. We, would we reform the political system, or the impeachment will play a role as the vote of the, uh, uh, distrust in uh, 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 a parliamentary system? Because in fact, in Brazil, impeachment is not caused by the crime you committed. Impeachment is a consequence 
of losing uh, uh, support in Congress. If you commit a crime, then it's easy to, to push through. And, well, it's not very difficult to find, you know, uh, the, the law is so ample. I'm sorry. Just a, a brief uh, intervention. I think people in the United States are very, probably very defensive of the U.S. Constitution. I don't hear stories that the Constitution somehow is infirm and needs to be worked with, and largely it's because it does deal in general concepts. There aren't special interests who are protected in the Constitution. Not to say that people don't see that they have particular rights under the general terms, but people, I think, see the Constitution as the symbol of rule of law in this country, and they're proud of it. And uh, there will be battles that will be fought. Uh, there are different opinions about whether the president uh, is performing adequately. Not over 50% right now. Congress is even lower. So, uh, the courts are a little bit higher, but not much. I mean, there are those, those kinds of shifting opinions, but the Constitution itself is really, I think, uh, rather solidly uh, perceived by most people in this country. Okay, uh, questions, please? Yes, please. Another anthropologist. <laughs> okay. Could, oh, sorry. Please identify yourselves for the. Yes, Diana Wells, and I'm part of Ashoka's global leadership team um, and an anthropologist. A similar question, which you old touched friend. on, um, <laughs> which is if you had to, with regard to the skepticism of the, toward the Constitution, what, have there been what are the political moments or the civil society entities or organizations that help build that credibility over time? Okay, wonderful question. Uh, one more, yeah, just let's get one more here. And who else wants to ask questions so we're starting to organize this? One, two, two. You, you, you want to ask a question? No, one and, okay, go ahead. No, uh, I guess I'm not speaking as an anthropologist, Lynn Hammergren, political scientist, but ex-World Bank, so I've, I'll speak for the economists as well. I mean, it, it strikes me you've got two things in your constitution. One of them is sort of the rules of the game for the political powers, and that apparently has worked. But the other one is all of the promises and the perks, and the fact that the Brazilian constitution, along with a lot of aspirational constitutions, I see this in Eastern Europe now, and you can certainly see it in Colombia, has promised things that are beginning to prove non-economical. And so the question is, how do you resolve that? Um, I'll leave that to you. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Janielli. I'm a student. I'm not in political science. I'm an engineer. Um, but I was in Brazil until two years ago, and I was there through the 2013 crisis because I'm from Brasilia, so I, I could see the Congress every day. I was going to the university. Um, my question is with respect to uh, an aspect that you're talking about. You mentioned how um, for the Constitution to be enforced and the rights and the privileges that come in the, the Constitution to, be, to actually take place, there is a certain requirement of economic growth. And what I've seen, and this is, was my experience, is that over time, especially after 2013, there was not only a distrust in the political government, but there was also a distrust on like, I'm paying my taxes, I'm not doing all I can, but I cannot get this service. And um, you mentioned, and with respect to this, you mentioned that you there is not a lot of political conflicts and political violence in Brazil. Um, but I do see, and actually I think last year we had one of the highest crime rates uh, in Brazilian history. Uh, we have very, very high, uh, uh, very high rate of crimes against women and very, um, like, angry, not angry, very, very, um, yeah, very evil crimes against women as well. And I wonder whether there's discussions about rights and this redefinition of what it means to be, uh, to have rights in the country. Who needs to have rights and who is allowed to have privileges? And whether do you think this also re relates to the new discussions about what is the Constitution and what should change about it? Okay. Wow. Impossible to answer all of them. Um, let's start by, by Diana's that I think I, 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 I'm more able to, to react to it. It's, um, and it's related to yours also. Uh, as I said, the Brazilian Constitution is a react, reactive 
constitution. Reacting against what? Against the immediate past of authoritarianism. We were leaving 21 years of authoritarianism. And also against a longer past of undevelopment. So there is this uh, 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 the, the social debt and the constitution clear adapt a developmentist approach that was uh, basically an hegemonic economic idea uh, uh, since the 50s in Brazil. Both right and left were developmentists with, with differences, but they were both uh, developmentists. So the constitution uh, was not uh, seen just as an instrument of government. I always remember, uh, I think I read this uh, many, many years ago, a letter from Thomas Jefferson to Madison when he was in, in Paris and the guys were building the Constitution in Philadelphia. Uh, Jefferson was an ambassador and say, where are the rights? And Madison explained it was very difficult. There was no consensus. And he said, well, I understand. It's an everyone's second choice. We, everything that we didn't agree was out of the Constitution. And I always think of the Constitu Brazilian Constitution as everyone first choice, okay? So it is an opposite Constitution. Just to, you know, the myth, uh, there is a wonderful um, academic work by uh, Tom Green uh, Ginsburg from Chicago that put all the Constitutions on the map, all Constitutions ever made. And the, the interesting aspect, uh, the Constitution that lasts more are the larger ones who have more words. So the U.S. Constitution is absolute exception. Why? Because normally constitutions that are larger, they were result of a more uh, inclusive political process. And being more inclusive, people have a more protective approach to the constitution. And obviously that a new constitution, take the, 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 the uh, tentative European constitution that was uh, in, the mid, in the middle of uh, last decade, it has 470 articles that was not approved in Paris and et cetera. So it's very difficult to make a small constitution nowadays. It was easy with 60 white men, same religion. So one thing is to have a consensus among people that are more or less the same. It's much more different to do uh, much difference to do a constitution in Colombia and in South Africa and in India. That's why they are all large constitutions because they were democratic built and people insert their aspirations. So, okay. So then, Diana, uh, obviously the civil society was key in the construction of the constitution in 1988. And civil society organized itself after 1988 based on the agenda set it by the Constitution. So if you have the rights, the educational rights movement that was born there, and their agenda was to implement the rights of education that were established. The same would go to health. The same would go to indigenous people. The same would go to women. The same would go uh, uh, to Afro-descendants. The same would go to human rights in general, environmental issues. is a very environmental concerned constitution. So civil society in Brazil is in some way a reflection. It's a, it, it helped to build, but then it grew as a side effect of the constitution. And most of the movements were movements in pro, in pro the constitution. And they helped to, to, to build strategies to implement the Constitution. The new aspect of civil society in Brazil, as perhaps is, is here was not as surprising as was there, is the recognition of uh, uh, uncivil society that was born after 2014. The, the concept of civil society was a progressive concept in Brazil until 2014. When Bolsonaro means I will end activism, which is not related to the court. He says the same to the court, but he's saying, I will end civil society. He is saying against the progressive civil society that backs the Constitution and acts in relation to the Constitution. And now we have a far-right civil society that criticize the Constitution, that criticize 
uh, other organizations. So this is uh, the, the, what I, uh, the, the hostility that we are seeing on the ground there. Um, I, I, I don't get your name. Lynn. Lynn. Okay. Very distinguished politics. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, economically, uh, obviously, that the, the regional constitution has immense problems in adopting a very uh, developmentist approach, the state center economy. This was reformed by, by Cardozo, even though many things less, mostly the corporatist interests in the Constitution. So, as I said, the Constitution is this uh, uh, mixture of very progressive policies and very regressive strategies uh, that concentrate. So I think the tension is, is very uh, uh, in the heart of the, of the Constitution. One difference, Lynn, uh, between, and I think innovative difference between the Brazilian Constitution and other aspirational constitutions as the, the India uh, Constitution uh, uh, 51, the, the, the South African, uh, the Colombia. Uh, one aspect, I think, one uh, uh, institutional novelty at, is that the Constitution is not just aspirational, say everyone has the right of education. It also says 25% of the tax collected by municipalities and blah, 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 should be expended in, 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 educa in fundamental education. Uh, with the health system is more or less the same, the same kind of clause. What we saw, I think there were, I saw the book this morning at your house, Marta Ahet books on inequality in Brazil. It's very interesting because if you see the impact of this consistent investment in the area of health, education, and poverty in Brazil, you could say it happened a velvet revolution in this country. We left the departure from 75% of the kids at school in 1988. We have basically universal education today. Well, the school is very bad. Yes, it's terrible. Yeah. However, these kids go to school, they, they eat, which is immensely important. They brush their teeth and they return home. And uh, the, in some way, the movement of 2013 is a result of a generation that experimented of social welfare rights. They experimented education. They experimented a health system that became really universal. And when the economic crisis started to hurt the expectation that they will continue to develop, yeah? and I use in the book the, the um, Burnton Moore Jr. Uh, uh, injustice, the concept, when revolutions happen, you say, revolutions not normally happen in a very unfair situation. It happens when people have a benefit and they see the expectation of these benefits to be frustrated. So you need to merge injustice with expectation and frustration. And in some sense, I think the Constitution uh, uh, strategy, not the economic strategy, but the, the social welfare strategy in Brazil was uh, uh, admirable in, in 25 years. Uh, the question is, and I said a little bit about this, I won't say more, but that the regressive mechanism inserted in the Constitution, they outweigh the, the... So that's why Brazil became less poor. The, the new middle class or, you know, went a little uh, up. However, it's still very unequal. And then I finalize with your point. Basically, Brazil um, uh, is one of the, the most unequal countries on the globe. Today, I don't think it's on 10th or 12th position in terms of inequality, which for a country that one of the largest 10 economy, it is a very problematic uh, issue. Uh, this uh, uh, inequality is a long-standing inequality. However, with uh, fast urbanization in the 70s, inequality and fast urbanization shift on the, para the, the paradigms of religion in the 80s. Uh, so inequality became a very uh, erupt uh, um, 
uh, the, uh, it caused a lot of erosion of the social tissue in Brazil. So Brazil is a fragmented society, in a fragmented society in many aspects, racial, but uh, in terms of, of, of wealth and access, uh, it's very uh, fragmented. And crime became, uh, with, uh, with involvement of drugs, it became a major issue. Last year we had 56,000 homicides. That's one homicides per hundred thousand, per twenty-eight homicides per hundred thousand. Uh, so it's a conflictual society, enormous conflictual. And how we cope with this violence? Police is being allowed to become more and more violent. So you have a conflict between police and uh, uh, citizens. Uh, Judge Moro is not helping in this way at this moment. It just send in his package, there's one uh, aspect which would flexibilize the use of force by the police. Uh, last year we have uh, 4,400 homicides by the police, uh, uh, which means um, a lot, just for you to have an idea. Sao Paulo is the less uh, violent state in the country. The least, I'm sorry, the least uh, violent state in the country. Uh, we have seven homicides per 100,000, which is a kind of civilized uh, uh, number. Uh, uh, I don't know, Washington, D.C. Uh, perhaps won't be much different than this. Uh, uh, Chicago is much more than this. US so, is five. Uh, U.S. is five. So Sao Paulo is basically in a, in a good position. The police of Rio, just the police, kills nine per hundred thousand. So the police is more in Rio. In Rio. It, it, it causes more crime proportionally than crime causes death in Sao Paulo. So it's obviously we have a conflictual situation and this government is uh, on, on, on a trap because it promised more security. However, its supporters are linked to the police forces that are the ones who really do not contribute for security in Brazil. They're, you know, have links with the militias, you have link with the, the extrajudicial killings. So it is a, 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 a terrible situation because uh, they are not proposing reforms that will leave us, uh, lead us to, to, to a better position in terms of, of security. Let me just add on that last point about uh, police conduct or misconduct. It's a big issue in the United States today. It's got a serious racial component. I think there's some of that in Brazil, but in the United States, yeah, I think what's, what's driving the debate is really its race-based quality, which candidly, you know, we're, we're doing uh, uh, our best to, to work through in a lot of cities, but take Baltimore as an example, which is in a very sad way. The police, after being accused of, uh, of killing uh, Freddie Gray and some of the general misconduct, stopped policing in a lot of parts of the city. And the crime rate went way up, and it's still way up there. So it's not enough to say the police are doing the wrong things and we have to do something about it because you've got police misconduct, if you do, but then you've got the police reaction to say, well, we're not going to police in that neighborhood. And then what? And we haven't solved that yet. I mean, we really are in the midst of that debate right now. And it, it probably, in terms of law and order, it's the most prominent uh, issue, I think, in the United States today, as far as law and order is concerned. Mm -hmm. Any final? I have one quick question that I wanted to ask you guys. Uh, it's about, let's try for the good news, kind of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people don't go home depressed. <laughs> No, there is a new, there are new political actors in Brazil. They are very young people, and they are a product of a reaction against uh, this old politics, this, uh, the political system in Brazil kind of imploded and fell on itself, right? It's, uh, but then, from that you hear, uh, and the person that best symbolizes all that is a, a young uh, congresswoman from Sao Paulo. She's 25 years old. Her name is Tabata Amaral, and she is really remarkable. 
in the way that she goes to Congress and she challenges the ministers and say, you need to present to us here a plan. plan to work. What do you want to achieve? Well, she actually was educated here. So she has that type of American, you know, what is the target and how you're going to get there. Because in Brazil we like to confabular. Uh, is this, and especially to Oscar, this is a question for you. We know that they are, Tabata is part of a movement uh, financed by some big money in Brazil that see that there is room for political renewal. Is there? How, how do you see uh, this new trend, okay. if, if it is a trend? Um, Paulo, even though uh, uh, there's a lot of pessimism, uh, my conclusion mm. is that institutions are surviving. They are functioning in a, uh, in a lower level of, uh, uh, but they are functioning. And this is amazing because constitutions in Brazil leave the average 19 years. So we have already 30. And we pass through this major political and economic crisis and we survive. And we elect a far right person and people on the left who say, well, we lost the election and that's it. So I'm not completely pessimistic in the sense that we will survive and, and, and we are you know, uh, uh, reorganizing and the system would move on. I'm not concerned about losing democracy. I think we are obviously will pass. This government will be tougher on, on rights and human rights specifically. We will lose a lot in terms of indigenous rights, etc. cetera, but it's, it's the name of the game. And so I don't want to be extra pessimist. I think we are holding on. Uh, that is my, my perception. Uh, it is interesting that uh, civil society is regaining space uh, uh, and both youth uh, that are appearing without the connections with the political parties. So there is um, several, most part of civil society, strong organizations in the past 30 years were in alliance with political parties. What we are seeing now is a civil society that is much more autonomous from, uh, uh, from the political system, which is interesting. And Ashoka knows this and part of this and, and new leadership and, and, and also these movements. So I'm very uh, excited. But a thing that I think we should take into consideration in uh, the rebirth or the, the birth of the Arms Commission, Human Rights Arms Commission that was created uh, last month, is interesting because people with 9, 40 years old, 8 years old, are reestablishing their connections that were lost during the tensions of the election in 2014, 2018. So you are seeing people from the left and PT and people from the center sitting together again to say, well, we have to deal with a far right uh, president that is a threat to the, 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 the consensus that we have built. So I think Brazil, this I'm very optimistic on this side, both the the, the renegotiation that is happening on people that feel on the democratic side and the new generation that is much more autonomous from the political system that are entering in the game. Thank you very much. Peter, any uh, Just the last comment. There, there was once a, a, a metaphor that was made about Brazil that it, it defies all the laws of aerodynamics, yeah. but it takes off. It yes. flies. <laughs> and I think that, that still is sort of an animating concept yeah. about Brazil. Yes. If, if we can make things complicate, <laughs> why simplify them, right? <laughs> so, but uh, Oscar, Peter, thank you very much for this. Well, but you will see, we'll have uh, a repeat of this because the book, as uh, Oscar said, is being translated at some point, uh, hopefully still this year, maybe yeah. later, will be released in English and will reconvene and uh, with an audience. And by then there will be new uh, 
important events in Brazil that saw the crisis. Hopefully another down. chapter will be added. Yeah, another <laughs> chapter will be added, but thank you very much.